thank you for joining the talk. The talk is about uh, reviews of the uh, built environment um, built up with Jenkins. Um, at first, um, we use Jenkins, but you won't find Jenkins so much in this talk uh, in the end. So it's more about uh, the whole big picture. Uh, but I think it's still interesting. Okay, let's continue. Uh, at first, I want to give you some yeah, uh, agenda how, uh, about the things I want to talk about. So first, some stuff about me, some stuff about our company. Uh, then I would like to introduce you into the problem itself. So what is uh, binary code reproducibility? Um, why is it worse to deal with it and so to somehow achieve uh, code reproducibility? Um, why is it so difficult in the end? So it's not such an easy problem and in the end I just want to show you um, the idea what we are doing uh, to achieve our goals. Okay, and I think there will be around 10 minutes for questions also. Okay, what about me? So, as already mentioned, uh, my name is Robert Pfaff. Um, I have uh, a degree in computer science also some uh, background in research um, at the University of Dresden. So I was a uh, researcher there at high, high availability, uh, scalability data area. Um, today I'm working at uh, Technizat in, as a software integrator, DevOps, and also systems engineer in yeah automotive area. Um, currently I'm in my free time, I'm also contributing to Salt Stack, and I'm also working on a, as a reviewer for a Salt Cookbook, which will appear soon. Um, besides that, uh, if I have still some time, I have also a high technical affinity, uh, so I'm uh, at least I was contributing in the 3D printing area, and currently I'm just building a PV drones because I like it. <laughs> Okay, what about our company? Um, Technizat itself, um, the Technizat group itself develops and produces uh, consumer and information technology products. It was founded in 1987. Today it has several locations in Germany and also in Hungary, Poland, USA, and China. Um, uh, in Technizat, uh, one of the interesting things about the company is uh, that everything is done in-house. That means uh, hard and software development and also production. So we have our own, uh, yeah, we have our own fabrics where we produce our circuits in the end, and we also develop the software for it. Uh, we are also a tier one supplier for well-known car manufacturers and. Uh, like Volkswagen, for example, and for them we develop solutions, uh, navigation systems, tuners, telematic systems, and so on. Okay, um, so uh, I'm uh, on my own, so I'm working at uh, Technica Digital and GmbH in Dresden. This is a research and development center. We have there around uh, 500 developers, which are working on, yeah, uh, mostly uh, customer-specific OEM concepts for the automotive industry. Yeah. Uh, besides that, uh, we have also an area uh, which takes care about uh, digital receivers and television areas. So these two markets, basically. Okay. Uh, let's come to the interesting part. <laughs> so, what is binary reproducibility? Um, in principle, the idea is simple, so um, all the, the uh, basics behind it are simple. Um, so if you have some source um, and you do some transformation to it, like a compilation step or you apply some script, you expect that the output should be the same if you doesn't change the sources in the end. This is the basic idea and you expect that this is uh, this, uh, this is true, or this, this holds for the whole time. So today, tomorrow, next month, and also in the next 15 years, 
which is important for the automotive industry because we have to uh, support our uh, software products uh, not just uh, months or years, but 15 to 20, 20 years in the end. And this gets difficult because uh, hardware changes, uh, you have to somehow take care of so it, the tool chain doesn't change and so on. So this, is, this gets complex. So the, the difficulty is you have to somehow identify and in the end reproduce everything which has influence on the final output. Okay, so the question is why do we need it in the end? As already mentioned, in the automotive industry, um, we have to uh, yeah, provide bug fixes for our software in, uh, for the whole time where we uh, support the software, which is 10 to 15, uh, 15 to 20 years in the end. Um, besides that, uh, it's an interesting feature that the customer has the ability to approve which parts of uh, which feature request changes which part of the software in the end. So that means if you have a, a specific feature that you are going to implement, uh, so say, now how do I stop? Say we have uh, one release and you have a feature where you know, okay, uh, that feature should change uh, has only influence to uh, some uh, module, like here, uh, like here. So this should only change uh, that part of the software. So now uh, one requirement is that uh, when you rebuild the software, um, only this part should change in the end. So it's uh, no way to go that uh, everything gets read here in the new release in the end. So that's why we need binary reproducibility. We have to show, uh, we need to show that only small parts changes, only the correct part changes in the end. Okay, what else? Uh, another important aspect is if you know what, um, if you know, if you have binary reproducibility, uh, you somehow need to know uh, which parts have influence on your tool chain. So, uh, and this helps you to reduce or at least and also avoid side effects in your build environment. So if you know what are the dependencies, you can take care of the dependencies in the end. Um, another feature is you have also some tooling or some handling on a tool, a tool chain and build system validation in the end. So if you know that your system produces binary uh, reproducible code and you have the same inputs and you change something in your build system and you get the same outputs in the end, you can be sure that your change is uh, does what it should do in the end at least. It doesn't change the output. <laughs> okay, uh, what else? As already mentioned, um, it's uh, you can achieve also some new level of trust to your customer because you can give uh, your customer some kind of tooling which allows your customer to prove that you are really doing what you should do. So you really change what you are allowed to change in the final software. Another feature is um, the independent verification of binaries. Um, this is um, something that comes also from uh, the Deepin community, which are also for, uh, forcing that topic. They are pushing that topic. And there, uh, by having the reproducibility, you can uh, give the community the tooling to show us that if you have some code, uh, some source, uh, they can prove that the output is really uh, as it should be, so independently on uh, different locations in wherever. So uh, it's not so easy to uh, yeah to do some malicious stuff with the packages and so on. Uh, another feature would be um, that uh, it's easier to validate uh, cross builds. 
So if you have a cross-built tool chain uh, like we have in our company, because um, yeah, like we have in our company, um, you can show that uh, if you make a cross-build on uh, some system, you can show that the output is as it should be, because if you make it on a native build and you have binary reproducibility, and you get the same outputs, you can be sure that uh, your cross uh, tool chain is implemented correctly in the end. Um, I have also found out uh, we, we didn't, uh, since finding bugs in software modules, so we haven't experienced this on our own, not yet, but I have also found this that it's helpful um, because if you know that your software should have some property and um, that means it should not change code and you experience uh, and you make some comparisons to the outputs and you see, okay, uh, my code is changing all the time, then, okay, so this is also uh, one way to think about why it doesn't happen, because it shouldn't in the end. And by digging uh, into the code, you can see, okay, yeah, um, there's a mistake. For example, you make some uh, random generation of uh, UI, uh, of, of some stuff that you will use as identification or whatever in the end, but um, and it should be deterministic, but it isn't. So at least it helps you somehow. Yeah, and besides that, um, as already mentioned, in the automotive, in uh, we are coming from the automotive industry, and we have also the special requirements that uh, our customers uh, want that we are uh, spice conform, so automotive spice, and that means. Uh, and one of the features of Spice is, is the ability to track, to have the yeah, ability to fully track uh, changes or change requests from the customer uh, from the actual requirement specification through the whole process down to the binary. And vice versa. So if you have a binary change, you can track it up to the uh, requirement in the end, and also uh, from top level to down, so from the requirement to the binary. So, And this is a real cool feature in the end, because it helps you yeah, in showing that you're really doing what you should do. <laughs> OK. OK, so uh, let's come back. Uh, why is it so difficult in the end to achieve? So let's start with this uh, simple example that I already had on the previous slide. Uh, assume we have some source code and we want to perform some uh, transformation, that means uh, a compilation step or scripts, whatever, and we want to produce some uh, target binary. So what is the difficulty with it? Okay, of course. Uh, at first, we have to take, uh, take care that our sources uh, keep stable. In the end, so imagine um, always imagine that we have a very uh, large, way, a very large time frame, so 15 years, and you have a really large code base. That means uh, gigabytes of source code, and uh, you somehow need to manage it. Uh, this is really simple in the end for that case because yeah, you can uh, use a version control system like SVN or Git, and uh, you sh should. Everybody of us knows this. You should use uh, tags and uh, some kind of management of the source code itself. So this is can be we can deal with that. This is not so problematic. But um, what comes into play is uh, now we have a version control system. And what about uh, if that version control system itself changes over time? So there might be incompatibility issues between the versions. So you somehow have to at least manage um, that the version control system uh, stays uh, compatible with the uh, original uh, system that you have used in the beginning. Uh, what else now that we have a version control system and that we have uh, some kind of tool chain that we are running, we need of course an operating system. And that operating system introduces some other problems. So, uh, or at least, at first it allows us to run a file system that we need for all that stuff, but the file system itself also has some 
uh, you might have some issues with the file system. So for example, if you have a very large code base with a lot of files, so thousands of files, yeah, in the end you might run into inode issues, for example. So this is also one case that you have to consider. So file system issues, um, or maybe also file system bugs in the end. So you have to take care of that. Uh, let's think about the compiler or the scripts that we have. Uh, if we have a compiler, um, that compiler, as a version of the compiler, of course, has to be, uh, keep stable over the time because uh, if you make a modification to the version, for example, for bug fixes or whatever, um, uh, they might have changed some libraries which might go into your uh, target in the end. So this is also something that you have to at least take care of. Um, another thing is, um, in the embedded, uh, in the automotive area with embedded systems, uh, like in our company, um, we are dealing uh, a lot with C, C++, passcode, or whatever, so we are using uh, GCC, for example. And uh, with GCC, um, the compiler might make random decisions. So for example, um, uh, it might guess uh, branch probability. So if you have a branch in your compilation step, um, it's not always, uh, it might use a statistical model to guess which would be the correct branch to choose in the end. There are switches for it to disable it, but you at least have to know it, that this might happen. And this is, has influence to your final source code, uh, to your final uh, binary in the end. Another thing is, uh, if you're using scripts, mm, these, like Python scripts, whatever, um, they are usually use some kind of uh, interface to your underlying operating system. And so there are some calls, uh, like, uh, yeah, if you process some files in the file system, whatever, OS work, for example, um, you might run into the sorting issues because um, the underlying implementation uh, you, uh, it somehow depends on the inode ordering in the file system. So it's not so deterministic in the final what you get. So it depends on the system where you are. And if you change something in your file system, the inode order might change, and then you might run into problems. So uh, what I want to tell you is that all this stuff, uh, this is a long way. You have to dig uh, deep into all that stuff and find out what, why, why doesn't it behave as it uh, should, and what can I, how can I deal with it? So uh, for that, uh, there are workarounds, so you can uh, implement your own wrapper and just take uh, apply some kind of logical ordering. So do it on a higher level and then you can deal with it. But as already mentioned, you have to know uh, the problems. Um, what else do we have? Um, so the operating system itself delivers us, uh, for example, timestamps. So it, we have some kind of interface and yeah. And these timestamps are also used by, uh, for example, in the compilation steps. So if you have uh, header files, for example, there are plenty of macros like uh, date, date time, timestamp macro, for example. And uh, this goes into your uh, compiled binary. And uh, depending on when you have compiled it, it might change your output binary in the end. Um, another thing is, if you, of course, if you use random random values in the end, or UUIDs, uh, all this changes. And another important aspect or aspect uh, that we have also discovered is that um, uh, also the local setting of the system itself might have influence. So uh, imagine, uh, so yeah, because uh, if the local is different, uh, it might not be possible to, uh, for example, read the files as it should be, or it might also have influence to uh, some processes that uh, require the files for, uh, that will read the files and uh, the sorting order might change, for example, because of the locals. This is also interesting. Uh, what else do we have? Mm. 
So if you, uh, for example, a workspace pass, uh, they are also compiled, uh, for debugging reasons, they are compiled into the final binary. And uh, for a just one system, this is not so complicated, but imagine that you uh, want to scale. So you have a cluster, a big build system, uh, many slaves or whatever. Uh, then you have to take care of that everything is uh, somehow homogeneous about, uh, among your cluster. Otherwise you get also uh, differing sizes and so on. So really interesting. Um, yeah, as already mentioned, uh, the GCC itself it makes some kind of random decisions. Uh, it has also some, uh, there also another problem. Uh, imagine that you have, um, that you have, uh, so there are access namespaces. Imagine that you have anonymous main, uh, namespaces. And inside these namespaces, you have functions. And uh, when you have a translation step, uh, there is uh, some kind of namespace mingling which is done. And uh, this is, of course, this has to be done uh, somehow randomized, because otherwise you would have an interaction between different anonymous, or you might have an interaction between different anonymous namespaces. So uh, this has to be randomized. Um, which also results in different uh, binaries. Um, there's a switch to it, so you can uh, give this GCC, for example, um, a fRandom seed, which is a basically a seed value, which will be used to generate these, uh, uh, used for generating random values when needed. Um, what else? So if you have object files, for example, and they are packed up into uh, archives, um, typically, uh, the archives also use uh, dates, times, and uh, UIDs or so, uh, which is, gets also problematic. As already mentioned, uh, the date, time, time, and markers whatsoever. Um, there's a workaround for it, so here you can fake the time in the operating system uh, with a library which is with fake time, however, uh, it doesn't work in the sub millisecond uh, area arrange. Another workaround would be to override some, uh, the macros itself. Um, maybe the best approach is to just try to avoid it at all. However, it uh, requires to start from the beginning eventually, which is not an option. Okay. As already mentioned, um, this is just not, uh, this, the first problems were just for if you. Uh, for systems that are not yet so complex. So if you get, uh, if you increase the complexity by having a really large source co uh, code base, for example, with uh, software that has uh, thousands of modules, maybe, uh, then uh, you have to uh, apply the principle of divide and conquer. So you have to divide everything uh, onto stages and uh, build up a modular software. And of course, you also need some kind of load distribution. So you have to introduce build slaves and um, maybe also virtualization at the end. So this also increases the, uh, or puts the problems that you have on a single system onto a system that is distributed now, which makes it even more complex. Um, as already mentioned, so you get extra external dependencies and uh, for dealing with this uh, multiple integration stage and modular software, you need some kind of release management in the end. Okay. Um, for our system, uh, we use um, multi-stage, so we have different stages for building up our software modules. And um, yeah, in principle, on stage zero, we built up um, just uh, uh, simple binaries, basically, uh, object files and so on that can be used in libraries and on the higher levels, we uh, compose these files into, uh, uh, we use these files as input and compose new binaries, basically, and in the end, at the highest stage, you will get a complete software. Um, the problem with that approach is that additionally, uh, you need some kind of artifact and dependency management in between because uh, you somehow need to take care that you get uh, these target binaries as inputs to the new uh, for the next stage, basically.
okay, mm -hmm. so how does it look like uh, in our system? Um, in our system, uh, we have uh, typically, uh, if you have such a uh, contact software, uh, you have some kind of release manager which manages uh, uh, which features go into which software release. And um, for that, we have a release management system which is used as interface for him. And uh, there he can uh, specify the features and the release management system itself then compiles uh, which modules, uh, which actual artifacts have to be used for that. Which is basically uh, what you can see here. So you get uh, basically some kind of uh, release definition in the end, which uh, is a tree-like structure which spans up and uh, for here, for simplicity reason, we have just three stages. Indeed, uh, there are much more in the end. Okay, uh, let's say that we have that specification for the release. Um, that specification will be mapped uh, onto Jenkins jobs, also by the release management system. And these Jenkins jobs itself, they are uh, um, they are jobs based or yeah that have some features. Let's put it this way, and these features basically uh, are references, for example, script references or source references to the actual artifacts that have to be used or parameters that are have to be used in the actual steps, and um, and we use. Yeah, in order to implement that, we use a special plugin, basically. So um, the release management system just uh, feeds up in the end uh, the configuration of the jobs, um, which is then used by the plugin. <coughs> OK. Uh, once you have uh, somehow mapped the the release configuration to, on top of the Jenkins jobs, these jobs are then mapped into a corresponding infrastructure. So imagine, as I uh, introduced, um, you have a lot of dependencies and issues uh, between um, your compiler and so on. So our approach to keep uh, all the stuff stable is to uh, have control over the environment. And uh, to implement that, we thought that it's uh, easier to spawn up a uh, new release environment, basically, for each release that we have to provide. And this is what we do here. So we have, for each release, we have a new release infrastructure, which consists of everything that is needed, basically. So we have, uh, for that case, we have the Jenkins master, which is fully configured, and we have also the corresponding slaves, uh, with the complete toolchain with everything, basically. And the release management system then maps uh, the uh, job specification, basically, into that infrastructure. That's how it connects. OK. Uh, this is the next step, basically. So how does it look like in the, uh, how does it look like the complete picture of the infrastructure, or almost complete picture? Um, uh, how, how do we take care that uh, we have this reproducibility feature? So the basic idea is that uh, everything is uh, specified. And we achieve that um, by, uh, for the infrastructure part, we achieve that by using a configuration management system, which is salt. So in principle, salt manages everything in our environment. It manages, um, it manages the required systems for uh, the build environment. That means the release management, uh, SCM, STMs. So like SVM or Git, uh, you also have to take care of that um, your namespaces has to be also managed. Because imagine you have ex systems, external dependencies, and uh, over the 15 years, whatsoever, uh, the DNS namespace is not allowed to change during that time. Otherwise, you run into problems. So we have to manage that. 
Um, there is also a bunch of QA systems uh, that you need, of course. So you have different quality gates and so on that you want to implement and analyze the systems and so on. So you need also somehow manage that. Um, that artifact repository that I mentioned, which is responsible for storing and providing the artifacts. This is all managed by Sol. Um, as already, where is my pointer? As already mentioned, um, as a whole system, the whole infrastructure is virtualized. So everything that is in that box is uh, virtual. And yeah. Okay. Besides that, mm. the infrastructure part of the releases is also managed uh, uh, by the specification and so on, so, which consists of the tool chain parts and so on. The higher level parts, so the logical, um, the release specifications and so on, then came from the release management system itself. Okay. So the basic idea is that for each, as already mentioned, the basic idea is for each release that we build, we bootstrap a new complete infrastructure. Uh, by salt and by the release management system. Um, after building the release, uh, what we do is we archive everything. So that means the complete infrastructure is just stored on reliable storage, uh, which gives us uh, one way to restore an environment and to have access on the information on that en environment. Um, besides that, indeed we have three, uh, three ways how to deal with reproducibility. So um, one is the uh, backup, the archive, basically. Another is um, the specification itself, because uh, if we have a specification for it, we can also recreate it from the specification. The thing is, um, you might not always cover everything in the specification. That's why we have also some other ways to deal with it. And uh, so it is, uh, yeah, you can also have a couple of backups to deal with civil stuff. Okay. Yeah, so the infrastructure bootstrapping itself, so um, as already mentioned, um, if you bootstrap a node, you have typically the node specification, salt configuration, release specification, and that is used to define the complete infrastructure. Um, typically what we do is uh, we have just images, uh, we have images that are prepared and these images are prepared in the way that they will connect to the salt configuration management system when bootstrapping and then everything else is done uh, by the configuration management system itself. Uh, after that uh, what we do also is uh, or uh, and features that we want to have is that we somehow want to maintain uh, or want to use all the Jenkins features, of course. So like a his a job config history or the Jenkins history itself. And if we would bootstrap or if we would start from scratch for each release, we would lose all this functionality. So uh, one way how we deal with that is we just um, basically, we clone uh, the Jenkins instance into the new release line, into the new next release from the predecessor. And then uh, we also uh, make some, uh, it's not a real copy, but it's some kind of copy of the actual history that belongs to the predecessor. Um, this is uh, just uh, copy on write, basically, so it doesn't change the history of the predecessor. It, in the end, it just builds up a tree of histories, and we can walk in that tree in the end. Um, this is yeah, how we can preserve the history. And finally, as already mentioned, if we have uh, created this new infrastructure, um, that new infrastructure will be adapted to the new release and then used for the new release to produce what we have to produce. Uh, yeah, that's it almost. Um, some lessons learned, maybe, in the end, uh, what we have uh, seen when uh, trying to uh, virtualize everything in our system. Um, 
as I mentioned, so we, uh, to give you some idea about the scale that we have, so um, we have uh, hundreds of gigabytes of source codes that we have to move when building a release, and so and thousands of files, so it's really get, uh, have a really high I/O workload, which is usually complicated in virtual environments. So what we do is um, we really try to optimize all I/O which goes in and out in the VMs. So and to do that, yeah, just try to put everything into RAM, for example. So use temporary file systems inside the VMs. Um, you can also save a lot of benefit uh, when uh, using caches for NFS or, uh, for example, for Jenkins itself. So the, we put our workspaces on LVM volumes that are on the host and then mount it into the Jenkins uh, system itself. And you can also use a couple of uh, optimizations in the system itself. So KVM. <coughs> um, yeah. That's it. I'm not sure where I am in time. About five minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, thank you so far. I hope uh, that it, uh, it's, as I already mentioned, it's not so much uh, Jenkins. Uh, I hope that you have found it. <laughs> um, maybe if there are any questions, just please start. <laughs> okay.